Good morning. Um, I was somewhere this week uh, where there was worship, and, uh, and the person I was with said, you know, that, that was pretty good. And uh, my response was, yeah, that was good, but I'd take Bethany and Laura any day of the week. And I'd even throw Fred in there. Huh? I think so. I think so. Would you guys repeat after me? Healthy things multiply. Healthy things multiply. Wow, you guys are awesome this morning. Let's say that one more time, all right? Healthy things multiply. Now, I'm not talking about once. Anything can multiply once, right? But in a perpetual sense, in an ongoing sense, it really seems like it's healthy things that multiply. We all know at least one person who thought to themselves, you know what, Um, my relationship, my marriage is broken. Let's have a baby. That'll fix it. Does that fix it? Even for, for those of you who maybe when you had, in particular, your first child, even for those of you who had a healthy relationship, did your first child, did multiplying create turmoil and difficulty and confusion? Right? And, and so it's, it's for these reasons that only healthy things can multiply. You see, unhealthy things can multiply once or maybe even twice, but, but they never ever multiply health, right? Because if we're broken, that's what we pass on. We pass on brokenness, and so eventually uh, that does not multiply well. So I want to show you guys a bunch of images this morning, and here's the first one. Look at this. I think in a world that is broken, in a world where, you know, we are broken, how do we get from being uh, in the world to being a disciple? How do, how do we take somebody who maybe has never, ever experienced church before and kind of would be on the top and, and get them to the point where they can say, you know, I am now a follower of Jesus, and what I'm talking about here isn't getting someone to the point where they're, they've prayed a prayer. What I'm talking about is getting us to the place where our lives are truly changed. Anybody can pray a prayer. If you not and if I not all prayed prayers and, and after the amen, nothing really happened? Come on, anyone else? Right? And so that's not the goal. The goal isn't a prayer prayed. The goal is a life changed and live differently for the kingdom of God. I taught a very similar message to this almost two years ago in a series we did, Unthankful. Uh, And and so some of the terms are going to be similar, uh, but this one has a lot more God in it. And you guys will see why in a minute. So, so let's look at that first image again. If we have, if we have this picture of the world and a disciple, I want to talk about three steps that we need to take in, in order for this transformation to happen, not only in our lives, but in, in anyone's life. And I want to make it as simple as possible because I want it to be replicatable, right? I mean, we don't want just our lives to be, to be changed. We want everyone's life to be changed. And so it's important if we're going to talk about anything that, that we would um, talk about something that anyone can do, that anyone can experience, because we all want the work of God to happen in our lives. So here's the next one. The first thing we, we want to talk about is, is the gathering, which is when we gather together as the church on Sunday morning, or, or whenever we do that, uh, Saturday or Sunday or, or, or any time. So when, when we gather together like this, and in, in this metaphor, let me talk about a couple things. There on the left, we see the words, the front porch. Um, this is actually some language that, that comes from a guy named Jim Putman that Pastor Jeff has read a lot about, who talks a lot about discipleship. And, and if we're really serious, if we're really serious about being a church, where people can come who have never, ever been to church before. And let me say this. Just a a couple weekends ago on Labor Day weekend, we had eight first-time families here that we know of, which means we had more probably than that. And and so we are insanely serious about this. We want to be a place 
where if you have, have never been to church before, this can be a place where you feel comfortable coming. You feel welcomed when you get here. The things that are said make sense to you. We don't, we don't sort of put on our Christian hats and talk with our Christian language, and you're like, well, what did that mean? We don't want to do that. Let me just ask this, and, and, and please, you guys have done well so far responding to my questions. I really need you on this one, because if nobody responds, it, it'll be bad, okay? So for those of you, and I want you to be honest, though, too, so really think about this. Who here maybe was never in church before New Hope, or maybe you, you kind of went to church some but it, it, was, it was really when you came here that you felt like you belonged, that you felt like you were loved, and this was a place that you could be you and that God could make a difference. Anyone? And so this metaphor, let's put that second image back up. This metaphor of the front porch is really important if if we really want people to be able to, to walk out of the world and into church. And you do things and say things on the front porch of your house or in the entryway. That, that you say them a certain way, right? And, and so let me, let me say it this way. Um, if you show up at somebody else's house for the very first time, and the first thing they say to you is this, hey, would you come down to the cellar with me? You should run. Right? I mean, this is like one of the horror movies we've all seen where we're like, no, 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 don't go in there, right? Like, run, run. This is not good for you. This will not turn out well. And, and the same, my friends, is true for churches. Have you ever been to a church like that where you walked in and you had no idea what was going on and you had no idea what was being said and you just, you're like, I'm going to have to come for six months to sort of break into whatever's happening. Um, and so, so this is really important. And that's one of the reasons why we're announcing today, and, and we already talked about it, that we're doing this New to New Hope thing on the first Sunday of every month. Because I really want us to be the kind of church where we let people know right up front, here's who we are, here's what we're all about. I don't want any of this two-year-in business. People are like, why? I thought we were going to do this. Nope. We want to tell you, you know, the first time you want to come to this third-minute thing, who we are and what we are all about. Because I don't have a desire to trick anybody. See, th th if this is not the church for you, um, and I believe this, we are on the same team as every church that lifts the name of Jesus all across the planet. Amen? Right. So if this isn't the church for you, I actually want to help you plug into a church that is for you. And so if you show up here, maybe, maybe you're here for the first time this morning, and you're like, man, the thing I want more than anything is Sunday school. Let me help you find a new church. Um, you know, I think that that's really important to clearly communicate who we are, because, because I remember in our first church plant, I had a guy, a really smart guy, say this to me. He said, you know, if you just spend the next year doing everything you can to build this church, it could really happen. And so what I did was, in that process, this is sort of my, what my strategy became. Like, if I was talking with a family who was kind of looking for a church, and they would describe their perfect church, my response was this. We're kind of like that. Right? Come, on, come to our church. We're, we're kind of like what you're looking for. And so maybe we'd shift this or tweak that to be a little bit more with... And then if I was talking to somebody else, even if they were describing almost the direct opposite... We're kind of like that. I want you guys to know we're not like that. You know, God has asked us to be what he's asked us to be. And, and I love, I love that every week and every month we have people walk in to this building who, who for whatever reason feel comfortable to come here. And this is a safe place where they can learn about and hear about Jesus and encounter Jesus and have Jesus change their lives. That's who we are. So we start with the gathering, and then as we continue down, the next image here um, is, is, is groups. And so where the gathering is the front porch, groups become the living room. Does that make sense? See, so we kind of get a little bit more intimate. Um, it, it, it's not just about, um, 
you know, hey, you're new here. Here's who we are. Let's give you a little orientation. Things get different. And groups are all about relationships, belonging, and care. Because you know what? Um, it doesn't happen on the front porch anywhere near as well as it happens in the living room. Is that not true? I mean, have you ever shown up at someone's house and you could really tell something was going on and they did not want you there? Maybe they like step out and close the door behind them, right? Because they want to either keep you from seeing what's happening in the living room or they want to keep you on the front porch, right? And so things happen when, when we move sort of inwards, sort of this, this metaphorical language that, that are, uh, these things are really, really important. And, and I think that, let's put that back up, just doing these two things well, a church can be unbelievably successful, right? So if you do the big thing well, if people come and they feel encouraged and inspired, that's important, isn't it? But isn't it also important that people in a smaller environment feel loved and cared about? Right? Both of the, and if we just do these two things really, really well, we can be successful. But they both have to happen. Both of these things. And if one isn't happening in your life, you're in trouble. And, and I see this kind of thing happen all the time, don't you? And, and this is probably the thing that breaks my heart more than anything. When people, people say things like, man, I just, I love, I love worship. And I love what happens. And, and I'm inspired but I still feel like I'm on the outside looking in. I don't feel connected, sometimes people say. I don't feel cared about. Um, see, see, that's what happens when the big thing is good, but we're not connected in a smaller way. Or when we're connected in the smaller way, but w w there's no inspiration that happens, that's a problem too. Um, Maybe you know people like this. I know people like this. I actually have people like this in my extended family who anytime I'm around them, they complain about their church. Have you, do you know anybody like this? If it's you and you complain about this church and me, don't raise your hand. Um, but, but anytime we're around them, they will be like, oh, you know what? Our pastor is in the, they go on and on about how the church is horrible and the pastor's horrible and Sunday's horrible until there's like some kind of like invite your friends Sunday. They're like, you want to go to church with us? <laughs> what? What? And, and inevitably, I get to the place where I say things like this. Well, if you really feel that way about your church, why in the world is that your church? And what do they say almost 100% of the time? Well, my friends go there. My family goes there. They're connected relationally. They, they have those important smaller relationships that cause them to feel loved and cared about, even though they don't feel like they're accomplishing anything. So let's look at that slide one more time. So we have groups, and, and, and it's the living room, and, and really the, sort of what happens as a transition from the gathering to the groups, we want to start this thing called Starting Point. And basically, it's an eight-week interactive conversation about some of the basics of faith. It's not someone telling you anything. But in smaller groups, it allows us to interact and say, hey, this is what this believing in God is all about. And we get to ask questions and have fun. Um, but it helps us to, to start to experience what life is like in groups. And I think what we're going to do with this is in January, we're probably going to do a series called Starting Point, where we kind of do it all together. Because for those of you who are already plugged into groups, we all want to start here. Um, but this is something we're, we're going to kick off in the near future. But... If you're here this morning and you're like, you know what, I'm, I come to the big thing, but I'm not connected in, in a group or in a smaller way, don't wait for January. Uh, pick up one of these books. Check on your connection card today that you want to get plugged into a small group starting in October. Um, volunteer to serve in a ministry. We've been talking about different ministries in the church um, every week, so, so, so do some of those things. So if, if we think about that, if we think about the gathering, we can come to this bigger thing with more of us where we, we don't really have time to like hang out a bunch, but it's, there's inspiration and teaching and learning and those kind of things. And, and then we come to a smaller thing and there's care where we love each other and care for each other and pray for each other. Um, what's missing? Isn't it mission? Do you see how we can come and we can celebrate, and that's great, and then we can love each other, and that's great too, and we can be really successful doing just those two things, but if, if there's not more, 
if we don't ever, and this is the, the next thing, if we don't ever go, right? If we don't do anything with that, who cares? Right? And, and I know, I know for some of us, we're like, but come on, I love Sunday. And I love my group. And, and that's kind of what gives my life some meaning. No, 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 don't miss this. Because this is about intimacy and accountability and impact, both inside the church and outside the church. This, this best happens in groups of two or three. And it's about following the example of Jesus no matter how hard it is. The metaphor here is, is the, the bedroom, right? I'm, I'm not going to go too far. I, I, I've taken the metaphor too far before, and people get mad at me. So I'm just going to say, that it's, it, this is where you, you, know, you get in, in each other's face, and you're like, hey, this is what, I, I want to live more like Jesus, and it's hard, and if we don't have that, it doesn't happen. And you know what? Uh, let, me, let me say it this way. Um, you know, if we're not living differently because of this, this isn't working, which is why small is better. And let's put that graphic up one more time. Here, the transition to get, I'm in a group and I'm being loved. Um, shape is the thing, the tool. And, and many of you have already been through this process. But it talks about our spiritual gifts. What, what, what are the gifts God has given us? What is our heart? What are we really passionate about? What are our abilities? What's our personality? And what, what experiences have we had in life? Because when we transition from being in a group to actually wanting to go and be on mission and make a difference with our lives, um, it's, it's really important, I think, that we do that in ways that are consistent with who God's made us to be, right? I mean, if you try to do something that, that works with who you are and who God has made you to be, is not, isn't that always more effective? than just doing kind of whatever. Um, And so we've done this in an ongoing sense, but hear me, it's useless without community. So why is going important? Why is it important that we actually go, that we do make a difference beyond just us? I want to answer this very simply. Because a disciple is always someone who makes disciples. Let me say it again. A disciple, it's not part of the time. A disciple is always someone who makes disciples. Let me say it differently. You could come here every single Sunday. You can be plugged into a small group. You could could give a million dollars in the tall red box every week. Hey, that's good. No. Uh, You know, you could serve your brains out in this could learn more of the scriptures like crazy, but if that is it, you have missed the point. Now, it's not that doing any of those things is bad, but they're just incomplete. It's like practicing for a race, but never racing. Does that make sense? Let's feel it in a little heavier way. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who is known as the Prince of Preachers, said it this way, Every Christian, every one of us who tries to be a follower of Jesus, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. What? Now, don't think about, I got to travel overseas and be, you know, learn how to speak a different language. I don't mean missionary like that. This is all about being on mission with God in our lives. Like, what is God doing? What does God want me to do? And I'm going to be a part of that. And as Christians, we don't have an option. We're either on mission, we're a part of what God wants, or we're an imposter. Another friend of mine used to say it like this, going to church makes you a Christian about as about much as going to McDonald's makes you a cheeseburger. Right? So, so we actually have to live differently. And this idea that we would, we would be disciples who make disciples is really about multiplication. And it's about multiplication on every level. On every single level, that's the next slide, we need to multiply. So this is true with disciples. If you're a disciple, you're supposed to multiply what? You're supposed to make disciples, right? Now, what if you have gifts? If you have a gift that God has given you, should you sort of keep that and kind of be the only person in the church who can do, use that gift? Or should you multiply? Should you take somebody else who you see that maybe God is gifted in that way and sort of bring them alongside you and help them to use that too, right? Is that what we should do? 
Is this not true in our roles? If you have a role or a job in the church, a ministry that you're a part of, is it not your job to help others serve in and find fulfillment in that, who, who kind of maybe have a similar wiring? Is that true? Now, what if you're a volunteer? I think this is where it starts to get interesting. If you're a volunteer, if you serve on any ministry here in the church, what's your job? Just to come and kind of fill in a spot when you're scheduled? We think that sometimes, don't we? Anybody else kind of get stuck in that? We're like, I'm I'm scheduled again. I got to show up, right? We do that, don't we? But if you serve in any ministry, your job is to multiply yourself. Let me give you an example. So um, if, you, if, you're, if you're a greeter here at New Hope, and, and let me remind you guys, by the way, because uh, we love to say this, if you've been here more than, what, like four weeks, you're a greeter. So smile and say hi to somebody. Right? Amen? Okay, so um, if, if you're a greeter, watch this. Watch, this is easy, right? And you're like holding, and, 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 and I think we had some first-time greeters today, didn't we? Um, who, who kind of said they said they wanted to, to serve in this way, and so I think we did. And so let's say you're there, and you're, you got your stack of, uh, of worship folders, and you're, you're handing them out, and you're smiling, and you see somebody walk up to you, and maybe, like, it's your job to sort of be happy, even if you're not, right, and smile, but maybe somebody walks up to you, and they are like, their smile is bigger and more contagious than, than yours. Now, what if you were to say this? Hey, it's great to have you here today. You know what? It's my job today to greet you. But man, you're like, you are greeting me and are way more happy and energetic than than I think I've ever been. I think you would be awesome at this. And this is really fun and it's easy and it doesn't take a whole bunch. You know what? Can can I connect you with the ministry leader over this? And would you would you be interested in doing this maybe once a month or so? Do you, do you see, guys, do you see how if we did that one simple little thing, how none of our areas of ministry would ever need to, to be recruited for ever again? You know what I mean? If we all multiplied ourselves, and it's so easy. This is true with leaders. Leaders should multiply other leaders, and, and gatherings should multiply gatherings. We talked a bunch it last uh, winter, like Christmas time, and just afterwards about launching a third gathering. And, and I just want to be honest with you guys about that. We, we, were, we were thinking October is when we would launch that. Um, and, and because we don't have enough people to serve in our ministry areas now, I, I think there's incredible need for another time slot that helps us to be able to reach people more effectively who can't come on a Sunday morning for any number of reasons. Um, but until we are able to, to function, I'm not going to kill all of us to do that. And so we're, we want to launch that third gathering, but we need people, to, and we invited you guys even in the spring, please, if, you've, if you're one of the 60, 70 people who said, hey, I'll serve to help launch this for you know, a number of months to get it up off the ground, and we're like, we need you guys to plug into these ministry areas now because we need an access of volunteers in order to multiply gatherings, multiply gatherings, and ultimately churches multiply churches, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But hear me here, church. Anytime I hear a ministry leader who needs to step down and we need to find a new leader, I feel like a failure, and I am. Anytime a staff member comes to me and speaks about being burned out, I feel like a failure. And I am. Anytime I hear of a ministry area that is crazy low on volunteers, I feel like a failure. Now, please, if anyone wants to come to me afterwards and say, oh, no, no, Rob, it's okay, you're not a... Don't say... I'll I'll punch you, okay? Okay. There's two reasons you could get punched today. That's one of them. I I don't have like a self-confidence issue with this, but this is what it's all about. We need to multiply. And if we're not multiplying ourselves as disciples of Jesus, we can never effectively multiply as a church. This is just unbelievably important. So, So to what end? Why is this important? Why do we need to do this? Like, do we just want to multiply so we can start a third gathering and then maybe a fo- To what end? Well, I want to share my favorite stat of 2013 with you. 
11 years ago on Easter Sunday, do you guys know how many people were meeting at New Hope Community Churches in this region? 11 years ago. Zero. This Easter, do you know how many people were meeting in New Hope Community Churches on Easter Sunday? 1,705. Isn't that awesome? So in Loudonville, in Worcester, and in Ashland, there were 1,705 people. I mean, that's kind of getting not too far from the population of Loudonville. I mean, we couldn't be that church here, but when we multiply, incredible things happen. And to be honest, we, we, Worcester's been growing like crazy. We still had more people in them, but the margin was slim. And, and I just, can I be honest? I'm a competitive dude. I didn't like that. I'm like, oh, we got to crush them. <laughs> no, but, but that's not the point. <laughs> I'm just being honest, okay? I'm just showing you, I'm showing you a piece. Tread lightly on me. Um, and while that number is cool, I don't want to spend too much time talking about 1,705. I want to talk about 10,000. I believe that we can start five new churches every 10 years in a conservative sense, especially when we get to that, you know, six and a half years from now when we, when we have the building paid off that takes a huge amount of our resources. I think we can easily do this. And working together more strategically with the New Hope family of churches, I believe we can get to 10,000 people meeting on Easter Sunday morning in 15 years. I, I honestly believe this. And for me to say this is both exciting and frightening all at the same time. Because business as usual is way easier than that. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us resources. It's going to cost us all kinds of things. I'm going to have to stop being as competitive and work together and, and with some more teamwork. But you know what? That is worth fighting for. Because business as usual causes all of us to get bored or tired. But if we believe that God has asked us to do something that we could never accomplish in and of ourselves, that's when life gets exciting. Amen? Anybody else get fired up by that idea that because of us, if we can multiply in smaller ways, we can multiply in bigger ways, and we could, in, in 11 years, you get to 1,705. Can you imagine 15 more years being at 10,000 because of how we're able to multiply churches all over this region? Guys, that, that fires me up. So that's, for me, what it looks like to, to get start, be starting to get the job done. That's, that's what is a, the win for me. And so today, I just want to spend a few minutes... Um, giving us a bite-sized piece. What's, what's the next step? What's the one thing we can do today? And I really want to focus on groups, how, how we need to be doing life together in more intentional ways in community. And so, Father, I just pray that, that you would help us to be a people who changes the world. Help us to be a people who loves each other, and help us to realize how those two things are almost one in the same. So, Father, as we spend the next just few minutes looking at a couple of passages of Scripture, God, I pray that you would, you would have permission to rip our guts out and help us to be the kinds of people that you have called and created us to be. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. We're going to start here. Uh, listen to what the scripture says. It says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So the only thing I want you to see here on the, this first one is this. There were people present, present who were teaching and leading. Do you see that? In, in, in the passage here, it's the apostles, right? So the, the apostles are teaching, and they're, they're, there's miraculous things happening. 
that the, the apostles are, are responsible for. So I want you to see that. So then the next, the next block of text says this, all of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So there wasn't just people who were present, who were responsible to lead and to teach. Don't miss that. Leave, leave that up for a second. Eh? Um, I, no, the, the, yeah. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. So there's people who are teaching and leading. And, and don't miss this. There are people present who were following at all costs, right? I mean, no matter what it took, if we got to sell stuff to get it done, we're going we're gonna to do that. You know what? I, let me just sort of throw in this a little bit. Um, if you want to ever give here at New Hope Community Church, here I, have my, I still have my thing here, my little envelope. Look at that. Like that. If you want to give here ever, give to reach 10,000 people. Give to impact this community. Don't give to keep the lights on. We say that sometimes because we want you to know that when you give, that helps make everything happen. Um, but if the reason we're ever giving is just to keep the lights on, let's just stop keeping the lights on. Let's make a difference with what we do. And hear me on this. We need more people who are willing to play the game at the level the scriptures are talking about. Because, because if we all played the game at that level, well, what would happen is instead of waiting a number of years to, to start launching churches, we could start today. If we gave um, here at New Hope Community Church as disciples, instead of how it typically happens, we could start this today instead of waiting until the building is paid off. So we need more people to, to cause, cause that's why, right? I mean, we're, we're all, all in because this is the most important thing on the planet to do. And then the passage ends like this. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice this. See this in the text here. The mighty work of God was immediately preceded by what? People sharing life together. People are sharing life. They have, they're, they're in the church together. They're in their homes together. They're, they're sharing life. They're going together in such a way that it changes things. And then God adds to the number daily those who are being saved. So, so let me say this to you this way. For you, um, when you see amazing, cool, crazy stuff happen, is your immediate first thought, wow? Or are you, are you kind of looking? Are you looking for the trick? Are you looking for the gimmick? What's really going on there? Right? Anyone else kind of looking for the trick first? But when we see community, this is actually the more powerful testimony. When people truly care about each other, when they really love each other, when, when they're praying for each other and there for each other, this is unbelievably important. When I was in high school, uh, some of us got into Amway. And I had the dry erase board. I had the briefcase. I had the books. I could show you the houses and the cars. Let's, well, you know, if you were independently wealthy, you know, I, I was great. I loved that. Was, I spent all the money I made that one summer in high school doing that, driving down to Charlotte, North Carolina for free enterprise weekend. It was crazy. I, I, I even bought their little sweet shots. That, you know, you shoot the little, I had... I remember spraying myself in the eye by accident once. That was, that was not good. Um, so, so there was this group of friends. We were into that. And I remember we, we tried to talk this one friend into being a part of it with us. Um, and, and he wanted nothing to do with it until one time we got a phone call about somebody who wanted to join our team. And we're all celebrating and high-fiving and hugging each other. And he was present, and he saw the community. And he's like, I want to be a part of this. Isn't that incredible? So I want to I show you guys an example of this. Can we do this? Can you guys grab this? You probably moved it off to the side. Everybody has a square. 
So take your square. Everybody take your square, okay? And if there's, this is where you guys can really help work together. If there is somebody, I'm going to move back to the chair, guys. Uh, if there is somebody here sitting around you who's not, doesn't have their square, you need to help me, okay? Talk to them. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the piece of paper, and I want you to fold it corner to corner. So basically fold it in half like, a, like kind of a diamond, not, all right? If there's somebody close to you who's not good at this, they don't have good dexterity in their fingers, you can help them. There's no rules here. You can help them, okay? We got, we got that one? Everybody there? Now what I want you to do is to, to open it up and do the same thing the opposite way. Again, if there, don't, this, we're going together here, okay, guys? Nobody, uh, nobody get lost in the shuffle. If there's somebody by you who needs your help, make sure you help them. Do you guys hear that sound of paper folding all over the place? That's kind of cool. All right, we, we all need to be there because the next fold is one of the two, well, there's only two tricky things here. This is tricky. So I want you to take this, right, because now we have this thing that goes both ways, and I kind of want you to pinch it and fold it together. Does that make sense? So this is, you may need to help your neighbor on this one. We, if we have school teachers, especially elementary school teachers, we may need you to walk around and help. So it's kind of flat, and it's, in the, and it's pinched in on the sides. Does that make sense? Bruce, are you there? Okay, do we need to do that again? Again, you can help people. So we have our piece of paper, right? And we just want to fold it together. So it's flat, and it... Nice, nice. This whole front row is good. Gabby, are you good? Is it on both sides? Okay. Okay. Yeah, see, that's how you want to do that. <laughs> see, I told that's one of the two tricky pieces. Okay, who needs help? Raise your hand if you need help. We need people to help, okay? Do you need help? Are you good? You need help? All right, I'm coming down. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Now, we got to wait. We got to wait. If you get left behind here, you're in trouble. Who, who still needs help? Okay, we need help back in the back. Someone over there, help, please. Nice, Jordan. Who else? Who else needs help? Are we good everywhere else? Hold on. Third fold, hold on. Oh, okay. Jordan, are we good? I told you that was one of the two tricky ones, all right? Nice. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing on the front and the back, okay? So what we're going to do here is these little points, we're going to fold them up to the peak. Both of them on both sides. Anybody ever done origami in church before? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Not in mass. Help, if, if you need help, talk to your neighbor, seriously. We won't, we're going together, guys. This is really important. On the front and the back, so do both. Just fold those all up to the peak. If you're like, what do you mean by the front and the back? You probably messed up the last step, and you may need to ask your neighbor <laughs> for help.
Okay, does, is everyone there? Anyone, else, anyone need help? Seriously, if you need help, that's cool. Okay, now what we want to do is we're going to take the outsides and fold them into the, the middle halfway line. So, so we have our, our, our front and our back, right? We're going to just fold the, these into the middle. Does that make sense? Anyone else? So it, it'll look like that because we've taken these pieces on both sides, front and back again, and folded them into the center line. So the little pointy pieces are at the center line. Are we on me? See that? On the front and the back. Look at that. That's pretty good, camera guys. <laughs> on the front and the back. I told everybody I could do this in five minutes. They were like, you cannot get everyone to do this in five minutes. They were right. I was wrong. That's all right. <laughs> um, now, now we're going to take... Do you see how there's these two little pieces up at the point? We're, we're going to fold those down so that they, they make their flat on top, and their little point is by that center point we just folded into the center line. Does that make sense? Look at this. So we take these two, and we fold them straight down, front and back. That's a great question, whoever asked that. Front and back. Are we good? Hey, who needs help here? Anyone? Uh, this is pretty sweet. Nice. You can help your neighbor, too. You can help your neighbor. All right. This, this, is, the, this is the last fold, but this is also a tricky one, okay? So these, these little things we just made, okay, you're going to watch really closely, okay? So these little things we just made, um, the side piece we folded that has a little pouch there, we want to kind of open that and tuck that in. So that little piece we just folded down actually becomes the thing we tuck in. So if, if that's confusing to you, again, who gets it? Who did it? Okay, so we have some people. We might need you to help. Anne, did you get it? Yes? Yeah? Can you help others? Okay. If you need help, watch Jackie. Are you there? So, here, I'm going to show you, and then you can go show someone else. Here, come here. So, so we got this so far? So watch. If you take this, and you just fold that piece in. See? So, so this goes like that. Yes, Th that doesn't that doesn't fold. Both sides, tuck them in. So they're actually tucked into the little pouch. Who needs help? That's the last actual folding. So we all need to be there before we unveil what we've made. If you know, don't cheat. Who else needs help? Anyone? Really? Are we kind of all there? Not quite yet? Chuck, are you there? You're, you're going you're gonna to be here again to try to... Hey, shh, zibit. Huh? Here, let's see. It goes in there, right? Yeah, watch. Watch. You open this and, and you fold that in. Okay. Yeah, see? So, yeah, no, you don't want to. That's this way. And then you just tuck oh, that right in. I got you. Okay. Like that? So it doesn't look Yeah. See, so on the other side, see? Did you get it? I don't know. I'm going to see. 
Nice. Jason's, Jason can help. Does anyone need help? Did he help the whole row, or does that whole row still need help? <laughs> Are we there? Sir, if you need help, raise your hand, because we, we want to... Are we good? Put, are you good? All right. The last step, one more time, okay? So we, we've take, when we took these little pieces and folded them down, right? We then sort of opened that little pouch and tucked those in. Huh? That was just one step. Oh, the whole, the last two steps, you wanted to be one step? That would have been more confusing. All right, so now here's, here's what we're going to do, okay? I want you to take it and fold it the other way so all that, all that funny business we just did is kind of on the inside. Eh, just make it look like this. And then you'll notice one of the ends of your thing has a hole. I want you to do this. Bruce, hold it like a star. Oh, there you go. There you go. An origami balloon. Hey, can, can you guys take just one minute and sort of greet each other and say, hey, look at my balloon. <laughs> All right. If, if yours didn't work perfectly, you can see me afterwards and I'll help you. So, so... Let's, let's start to wind this, wind this down, all right? Check this out. I love this African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Some of you did not like that exercise. Some of you do not like the idea of having significant relationships with other people. You're like, I don't like that. Don't mess with me. I got my couple friends, and I don't want a bunch of other people in my business, right? You could say, Rob, I will never be as good at making origami balloons as you are. But hear me on this. Yeah. Hear me on this. It would have taken me all day to make... 180 of these all day. And it took us together about 10 minutes. Isn't that incredible? Do you, do you see? Do you see how every single one of you is necessary in the work of making disciples if we want to multiply? Because you can say, Rob, you're better at that, or that person's better, or that person's better. We need you. We can make more together. So if you won't choose community for yourself or for us, I want to ask you to choose it for me. And I want to read one more passage as we end today. Acts chapter 6 says this, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So basically put, stuff, was fallen through the cracks. Anybody else ever get busy and have stuff fall through the cracks? Right? It happens, right? I actually had a friend who pastored a church a lot like New Hope, and, and they did the, a once a month, kind of like our, what our new to New Hope's going to be, where he would meet with new people, and he would say this to them. He would say, you know what? If you are coming to this church because you want to be friends with the pastor, you should leave now. Because our 30 minutes together in this thing may be the most time you ever get to spend with me. This is a church same size as ours in a rural area like ours. 
And he told me that. I remember, and, and, and I want you to know, um, I, it, sometimes I wish I was wired like that. That's not me at all. Um, I'd like to say I've, I've grown a little bit, and I don't let my family um, get sacrificed anymore. And so I will not sacrifice them for you. But I do want you to, I'm just going to be honest about me. If you pin me down, I will hang out with you to the detriment of my health and to the detriment of our church. It's just how I'm, I'm wired to be with people and to hang out with I will spend more, t- if, you, if you can corner me, <laughs> um, I'll do that. In, in, in long term, it's not healthy. And so the text continues like this. The twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. There's a lot of people that need help. There's a lot of people that need food. It's not right, the apostles are saying, for us to do that and neglect what only we can do. Because there's certain things that only I can do, and it's not good for me to neglect them, even for you. And and hear me on this, my heart is for you. So I want to give you just a snapshot of my day sometimes. If I have a day where I have meetings all day, sometimes I'm opening my computer for the very first time at like 5 in the afternoon, maybe 6. Um, I had a day like this just, just early this week. And I had 85 emails in my inbox. I, have tw- I had 12 text messages, 7 voicemails, and 3 messages waiting through Facebook. And people get mad at me because... We're not spending as much time together as we once did. Um, And when someone doesn't feel connected, the first response in my heart is always, I can connect with them. I can love them. I can be there for them. There's only one problem. I can't. There's too many of us. And there's too many people coming in from out there for me to love and connect with everyone. And so if you're a staff member or an elder or you're a part of my small group or you're someone who is just hell-bent on multiplying yourself like crazy, beyond that, it's hard for me to spend significant time with people. And I feel that tension every single day. So here's how the text ends. Brothers and sisters, They said, choose seven from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group they chose. I cut out the seven names. They presented these guys to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them so the Word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of the priests became obedient to the faith. Does it not make sense to every one of us that if we get more people doing something like the balloons, we can get more done? Right? We need to multiply and give ministry away like crazy so that, like we just read, the word of God can spread and so the number of disciples in Loudonville in this area can increase rapidly and a large number of people can become obedient to the faith. We've got to share life together. And so the, the question, the only question I want to ask is this. Will you go together? Will you plug into a group? Will you share life with others? Will you serve in a ministry? Can we do this together? Not just to plug holes in schedules, but because we really believe in multiplying ourselves so more people can know and experience Jesus. I don't care who you are or what you've done. You are welcome to go with me together. I don't care. Get a book and help connect in a group. If you're interested or maybe you've helped uh, facilitate a group before you want to, come to our meeting next Sunday for anyone who's a small group leader or who wants to be because we want you to help be a part of this. It's at 1230 next Sunday. Step into any area of ministry. Just Don't go by yourself because we can accomplish unbelievable things together with each other and with our God. And on that note, I would like you to put your hands together and welcome to our stage 
our world changers for this week. Can you welcome the, some of our cafe workers? Good morning, New Hope. Uh, we have a little something for you. Ready? Ready? Uh, welcome to New Hope. Oh, they don't fly very far. <laughs> hey, 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 can I try? You guys maybe just don't have a strong enough arm. Okay. Wing it. There you go. <laughs> you know, it, it, okay. Who wants it? Oh. Who wants it? Okay, Chuck. Oh, I tried. Oh, Kathy. <laughs> uh, this, it all started with this donut hole. As anybody here was, was anybody here at that time? Oh, yeah. A good deal. Um, well, as you know, they were free. And back then, the cafe was retired referred to as a hospitality ministry. The cafe embraces the spirit of hospitality. The dictionary describes it as being eager and friendly towards guests and new arrivals. That about sums us up. Mm. Um, we strive to let God's light shine through us, through our smiles and through our actions. It's been proven that every one is more comfortable talking to other people um, with something in their hand, like a, you know, <laughs> like a cup of coffee or a <laughs> bottle of water or something like that. And we're here to make people feel comfortable. Um, we have a wonderful group of women and one guy, bless his heart, yeah, uh, they do an amazing job of this, and we have room for lots more. So, um, Kathy's agreed to help me today. <laughs> I'm not an upfront person, and you don't have to be an upfront person to work in the cafe. So, there you go. She did Thanks, great, Kathy. didn't she? She did great. <laughs> um, Cindy heads us up here. She is really the heart and soul of the cafe, and. I actually, I was just trying to remember last night, how long have we been doing the cafe for? Because that was our first sort of ministry that we started serving in. And I think, Cindy and I were just talking too, Lacey was pregnant at the time, her daughter. So it's been at least five years ago, and I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when Al and I started here at New Hope, we were like, wanted to serve somewhere, but didn't know where. And the cafe was a great place to kind of get our feet wet um, because it wasn't a huge commitment. We didn't have to be upfront, like you said. We didn't have to work with kids, or we couldn't really mess anything up, um, <laughs> except for the coffee. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we, so we. Um, but it, it's a super ministry to work with. Cindy really, like I said, is the backbone. She handles the schedule. We show up a half an hour before um, the service each time we're on the schedule. We help do the coffee. We help serve donuts, take the money, do the pretzels, whatever's needed, and then we can come and watch the service. So it's really great because we're not missing the service, you know, we, we or the gathering, we watch the gathering, and then afterwards we, um, afterwards we help clean up, take out the trash, and that's where the men are wonderful. My husband takes out the trash for us, and he helps with the coffee, and then we're done, and it's generally about once a month that we do this. Um, Cindy, though, I'm going to throw in a little catch for her because she is amazing at going to Sam's Club, going to Steaks, getting the pretzels and the supplies, and she could even, I know, use help behind the scenes doing that stuff. So if anybody would like to help behind the scenes or out front in the cafe, it's a great ministry to start off with. If you're looking for somewhere hmm, to start serving, we need you, and it's great. It's easy. It's fun. You know. Couples are great. Yeah, couples. Al helps me all the time do this stuff. Like I said, make coffee, take out trash, make pretzels, whatever. Men can do it too. So it's great to work together. We welcome you. So, so we're, I'm going to dismiss you now, but let me say a couple things because you guys are going to go and talk to people, right? Yeah. So, but let me say this, guys. Um, for the month of September, Cindy's been on about 50% of the time because 
we don't have enough people, so she just fills the holes. And, uh, and so right now in just a minute, will you talk to her and say, hey, how can I plug in or how can I help or how can I serve? Because the reason we have a cafe is not to sell you guys Mountain Dew and sugary stuff so that you stay awake in here. That's not the purpose. It's to create community. That's right, because I can hear that. It's, it's to create community. It's to give us opportunities to share life together. So you guys can go, because I want you guys to be out there for people who want to talk to you. And, and as you go today, as a church, let's share life together. And we, you know, you may want to check that you want to be a part of a small group in, in your worship program. Do that. You may want to go to the bookstore and, and order one of those books, because you want to be plugged in in that kind of way. But here's something we can all do. As you leave today, grab a donut hole and share life with somebody else. All right, let's do that. It's great to have you at the gathering today.